Hey, pull up a chair. We're so glad to have you join us here on the Back Porch Education Podcast. For the next half hour or so, we're going to talk about all things educational. It's a wonderful day to learn something. Glad you could join us. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Back Porch Education Podcast. Here with Steve again. Steve, guess what I have today? Um, I'm going to guess, because you asked me to, and say that you have a piece of coal. Oh, I don't have a piece of coal. I have a poem that includes coal. Oh! <laughs> oh, well, I would have never guessed that you had a poem, but yeah, you asked me to guess, and I did my best, and oh well. Yeah, good try. Why don't you read your poem for us? All right. Well, here it is. This one's by John Ciardi, who is... Uh, kind of a legend i think he's done some pretty big stuff um i learned about john ciardi uh, in his translation of dante's divine comedy uh but he also has a really famous book i think it's called how does a poem mean um i have not read it but it is widely uh celebrated people that i know talk about it um so you know, do with that what you will. I don't know if that's a recommendation <laughs> to read it or stay away from it. But um, anyway, this poem is not from that stuff, though. This uh, is a poem that I have pulled out of one of Mary's books of poetry. Um, and it's fun. OK. And it does contain coal. Like uh, like you said, it's called Mummy Slept Late and Daddy Fixed Breakfast. Daddy fixed the breakfast. He made us each a waffle. It looked like gravel pudding. It tasted something awful. Ha ha, he said. I'll try again. This time I'll get it right. But what I got was in between bituminous and anthracite. A little too well done? Oh well, I'll have to start all over. That time what landed on my plate looked like a manhole cover. I tried to cut it with a fork. The fork gave off a spark. I tried a knife and twisted it into a question mark. I tried it with a hacksaw. I tried it with a torch. It didn't even make a dent. It didn't even scorch. The next time Dad gets breakfast, when Mommy's sleeping late, I think I'll skip the waffles. I'd sooner eat the plate. (laughs) Ah, that takes me back. You know, my mother, when I was five years old, had to have back surgery and couldn't leave a supine position for about three weeks afterwards. And my uh, dear beloved father, who I respect in many, many, many ways, but not as a chef, um, <laughs> the dear man did his best and pretty much burnt everything that went in that kitchen. And my little next door neighbors, three little girls, uh, a couple of them a little bit older than me and one my age, um, heard about my plight and would sneak me. They would bring me food to the stump. (laughs) We had this old stump in our backyard and I didn't want to hurt my dad's feelings, but Uh, I mean, this poem has it down. You'd rather have the plate. Well, yeah, I was so thankful that they would sneak me food. They didn't want, they didn't want their mom to get to my dad. So it was all this highly secretive thing. But the only thing I ever ate of his that I could digest was green beans from a can as long as he got them off the fire quick enough, but Oh my goodness. So, uh, we're well, our, our episode of, of burnt food. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, let's, let's transition from burnt food. I want to talk about this quote from Jack London, uh, that I came across. Oh, well, or not really. What I really want to do is use it for a pretext for talking about whatever I want to talk okay. about. Well, we're good at that. <laughs> but, so, but um, yeah, yeah. So Jack London, he wrote some famous stuff. But I'm reading this this little collection of stories about his time as a railroad tramp. It's called The Road, and in it, um, he has this this quote. He starts one of his stories with this. I want I want to read the way he starts it and. <laughs> I want to use it as a way to kind of talk about what we want to look at. But the word that really caught my eye 
was a word that I had never read before called telic, telic, or not called. The word is telic, T-E-L-I-C, okay? So, you know, the astute students have already probably noticed the Greek root, uh, you know, the telos, but pause on all that. Let's hear the quote first, okay? Um, This is how he begins the short story pictures. Perhaps the greatest charm of tramp life is the absence of monotony. In hobo land, the face of life is protean, an ever-changing phantasmagoria where the impossible happens and the unexpected jumps out of the bushes at every turn of the road. The hobo never knows what is going to happen the next moment. Hence, he lives only in the present moment. He has learned the futility of telic endeavor and knows the delight of drifting along with the whim- whimsicalities of chance. Well. Okay, so the that got me, man. The futility of telic endeavor. So, like I always do when I find a new word, I ran straight to Webster's 1828 dictionary, and I looked it up. Telic. It's not in there. So that tells me that it's a relatively new word. (laughs) (laughs) So it's good. I wonder if it isn't what you you said earlier, though. I think it's a derivative of a very old word. Yeah, I think so, too. Now, and but that okay. so but that's the thing. That's why I like 1828, that dictionary, because it's helpful for seeing like words that we use all the time. Um, Like one another one that comes to mind that's not in 1828 is propaganda. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? So there's, so uh, anyway, telic. Um, I think it's a derivative of an old word. And so, you know, then I, okay, well, Google, what do you say? And of course, Google tells me, um, I have it here, of an action or attitude, it is. it means directed or tending to a definite end. So not that much different than, you know, we might say teleological. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, which I like telic more because it's shorter and doesn't sound so three dollar wordish. Well, and it's an adjective. It's you know he applies it to endeavor. Right. He's not saying that there's a futility of endeavor, but he's just he's just dissing the idea of planning, pur- purposeful endeavor, right. and especially right. for the hobo that makes sense. I mean he 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 lacks telos. He's just trying to survive. He's not on his way to somewhere. He's often on his way to wherever the train takes me or whatnot. Right, right. The road is the destination. Like, there is no destination. It's just the being, right? Right, right, right. So, So I ran across your term back in college, and when you ran your quote by me before before we started the the recording today my mind ran back to that discussion because as a college student i got kind of excited about the 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 comparative um that we we were in psychology class and we were talking about modern theories that sprung out of the modern mind Ooh, and okay. uh one was this notion of reversal theory this this notion that man would do better to not work himself to death, but play himself to life. Hmm. And the terms that the, that the theory used, um, and they seem to be prominent in this thing called reversal theory, uh, was that there were two states of mind, one, the, the telic or serious mind. (laughs) And you can, I, I'm 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 in college in the early '80s, folks. Not long after the '60s did their thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the 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 paratelic or playful mindset was set over opposed to that, uh, and and the one is motivated by achievement, future goals, being a success. That's the telic mm-hmm. person, and, and then the paratelic is just a guy that's that's there in the moment, enjoying the journey. 
It's not about where we're going. It's about how we get there. And, uh, you know, Hollywood loves that. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a lot of that in, in a lot of modern films, uh, into the wild. I don't know if you ever seen that or not, but, uh, Oh yeah, I have. Uh, you know, it's very much about a guy just saying, I'm tired of all this, my parents' plans for me. I'm just going to go and, and go. He does. I won't spoil the ending for you, but right. go. He does uh, burns sure. his cash in a glorious moment um, and mm. is just out there. Uh, mm-hmm. and, th- and th- there's just, there's just lots. I mean, uh, Kerouac, right. Is the, the yeah. guy that yeah. made this notion, I think somewhat popular in the young mind. So, so we wanted to bring it back to education a little bit and go, what about this telic endeavor? And it's at least according to London futility of telic endeavor. Uh, mm-hmm. how, how does that come into the classroom? What were your thoughts there, Jason? Yeah, I, I'm not, I, I didn't know anything about that whole reversal theory. Um, I didn't stumble across that. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, and while I think, I guess London was using the word maybe before reversal theory, like sort of did its thing. Yep. Um, I think yep, that yep. is an interesting point of like, that's an interesting use of the word, like a technical use. Um, and I'm excited to see kind of how that unfolds. While this show is a back porch discussion, it does cost a little bit of money. So if you're liking what you hear, consider helping us out. Simply use the donation button on the website to send along a one-time gift, or we have subscriber plans for those who want to commit to regular support. Subscribers can get premium rewards depending on how nice a chair you pull up on the porch. We have everywhere from sitting on the floor to our finest rocking chair available. But whatever you can do, know that it helps us keep the conversation going. And for that, we heartily thank you. So as we come back from the break, um, I wanted to talk about the fact that London himself embodies this notion of, of telic endeavor being somewhat futile, especially in the context of most London stories, which is in the wild, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? He, he, he call of the wild or, or a white fang or whatnot are set in this harsh Northern setting of the Yukon. And, uh, you know, he's he's thinking through man flourishing, being at his best, the closer he lives to instinctual rather than rational endeavor uh, that that he, that a real mm-hmm. man has to overcome the harshest of opponents, which is nature itself. And and so Buck, for instance, the dog that we meet and follow through Call of the Wild is ultimately able to flourish most when he's away from man's plans for him and pulling a sled and being beaten and and even the love that he has uh you know for his kind master the one that he's loyal to and pulls the incredible amount of weight for and wins the contest you know if you haven't read the story do so it's a great story but but at the end when he's finally answered the call to go into the wild and be wrapped up in uh, a couple of dozen times throughout the story, London references the instinct that's being awakened in Buck as he gets into the wild from generations and generations and generations ago. Mm -hmm. The, the lessons learned in the wild are, are ever with him, even when he started out as a fairly spoiled little pup on a nice little farm somewhere in California, I think it was, and is sold by his master for money to to go up to the Yukon and become this sort of you know horrible human slave for a while. Um, there's a there's a delight in London about getting back to basics about. Right. Being in the moment, in the wild, j- just like you explained, uh, or like he explained with the hobo, we don't know what's going to happen next. And so the right. the excitement and the delight is that magical, m- mysterious, mystic 
uh, uh, experience of, of let's see what happens. And, and I think that that's legitimate to some extent in the classroom. I don't think you can go all the way there. <laughs> but uh, well, that's but that's the question right and and I, and I think that's what the whole that's what this quote is really allowing us kind of to to jump into and to talk about that's what I want to know is like to what extent well okay for the hobo telic endeavor that is work aimed at some goal is futile he says that it, it's it's pointless. All that there is is the present moment. Like you can't work for something in the future. Um, okay, well, as a teacher, I don't feel like I can subscribe. You know, like in my job as a teacher, I there are now. Don't get me wrong. There are days when I'm tempted to subscribe to that, you know, when when class is not going well and 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 it's a it's a bad day and you know people are not getting along and and just it's not working like you want to. Yeah, you're tempted to say that uh, any working towards an end is futile. But but I don't think I can. But yeah, so you're at the heart there of of what I think Lewis is talking about in the abolition of man. Mm -hmm. When he in his chapter in Men Without Chess, he he's talking about this modern tug of war that we've caused for ourselves when we get right. rid of the chest. You have yeah the ape or something trousered apes right you have, yeah the trousered ape you have the rational logical sort of uh, intellectual man yeah who has destroyed education these days by believing that it's all reduced to data and uh -huh. they correct curriculum and that if mm -hmm. we would simply do thus and so, we would get what we're looking for. Right. And, and, and most of us, most Americans, I think post sixties kind of go away. <laughs> hey, you're trying to fit me into some sort of a box and if I don't fit into your little tiny box, I'm going to get, you know, kicked out of it. Yeah, that's that's not education. So so Lewis says there's the there's the intellectual computer who everything must be planned and logical and and it's completely telic. Yeah, right. Good. Right. Right. Okay, perfect. Right. And then down below, he, he puts it in our in our belly which is where the Greeks and, and the Apostle Paul put it. Remember, Paul condemned, was it the Colossians? Their God was their belly? No, um, no, no not the Colossians. They're awesome. The Corinthians, wasn't it? Well, Ooh, I'll look it up and so we'll sound smart. It's, so this is like a, a, some people do this with, with podcasts. This is like a quiz. Right, <laughs> Philippians. Write in and tell us. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> and while you're doing so, you know, hit the donation box. Uh, anyway. <laughs> So, so, uh, so, so, th the people whose God is their belly are the people who completely controlled by their appetites, by their feelings, by what they want to do in that moment. These are the paratelic people, again, somewhat of a caricature. Sure, but they only ever do what feels right at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he says, of course, God's given us a heart, a seat of of harmony. This place that that instructs a, a conscience is the correct term for it that tells the head when it's being too heady and is constantly telling the appetites to order themselves love the the best things most right and yeah sure we would love to this, this is what you're describing there's moments in the classroom when when the teacher's belly is going away with these lesson plans they're just not working. <laughs> you know, these kids or, or or it's just it's the day before Christmas vacation or whatever and and I'm just going to pitch it because I f I don't feel like it's going to work. Right. And of course there's a lot of teachers who enter every day even when evidence argues against them they enter the classroom every day with carefully written lesson plans that that could be laminated. You know? right, right. And uh I'm going to teach it this way for the next 25 years, come hell or high water. And 
and, and, and and I think the middle is I think there are times when planning is the only hope we have. I taught middle school for a number of years. You walk into a middle school classroom without a plan, you're just begging for problems. Oh, definitely. But if you walk into a middle school classroom with a plan that's inviolable, <laughs> you're going to have problems as well. There's got to be this wisdom. Absolutely. Yeah, so first takeaway for the day, if you walk into a middle middle school classroom, you're going to have problems. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the seven greatest years of my life. Yeah. And I used to try and teach logic to eighth graders. Mm. Figure that one out. I, I a... had the same assignment. I also did that. <laughs> mm. Yeah, we nice. band of brothers. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. Now, I know, bear with us, everybody, because I know we're dropping a lot of people and a lot of quotes, but we're, we're framing the issue here, and I, and I think it's helpful. Steve, um, you and I have a very mustached uh, common friend who I think at this point, if he's listening, is probably just screaming at his computer about Edgar Allan Poe because um, <laughs> Poe has this amazing essay. I don't know. We'll find it and put it in the show notes. But um, it's, it's about the uh, – he talks about education – being um a stamp and and the student being the wax and education is the slow imprint of the wax right like and if you if you get the wax too hot or you push too fast or you don't push long enough then you're not the education the stamp will not take properly so and that is so even on those days when we feel like oh this isn't going to work it's that slow imprint, right, over time. That is um, sort of what causes the education. You can't just teach on the good days, right? You have to sort of persevere. Um, but that's what I'm interested in. You know, like let, when we get back from break, let's talk about that. Like let's talk about what, to what extent we as teachers should persevere and push through and stick to the plan and how much room there is for wiggling out of the plan or just lighting the thing on fire and, and, and starting over. <laughs> hey, during this brief break, I wanted to encourage you to use the share buttons we have on our website in order to help us get folks tuned into the show. Our goal is to encourage as many educators, homeschoolers, NFL punters and donut makers as we can with these podcasts. So help us get the word out. Share our Facebook page. Send folks a link to one of your favorite episodes. Do whatever you can to help us share this craziness with either your best friends or, if it's more appropriate, your worst enemies. We will love you all the more for sharing our love. Thanks. And now, back to the show. Okay, so the question that I asked was, when do we stick to the plan and when do we burn the lesson plan and start over? Um, and okay, so I, I want to notice one quick thing about that. First of all, that implies that there is some sort of plan, which I sort of have just taken as an assumption. I guess there are those who say, oh, you don't need a, anything at all. Just walk in and, and go for it. Um, I've done that before and, and it hasn't always been horrible, but even then you're still, I was still aimed at something. My endeavor in teaching was still telic, right? I was still after something. Um, uh, I was still trying to instill wisdom and virtue or cultivate wisdom and virtue. Uh, so I still, I would still say I had a tell us, even if I didn't have a roadmap. Yeah. But now I'm mixing metaphors. Well, let me let me throw another metaphor in there, right? The forest and the trees. I think that the individual tree lesson plans mm -hmm. yeah. just don't always work. But but we've got to remember we're in a forest. And if we uh -huh. started in at one end, we hope to come out the other. <laughs> uh, right. for those of us in high school education, this is this is a four year road. And and, and using wisdom to determine if today is one of those days where we just really rock and roll and get get a lot done, 
or I, I, you know, this is, this is where wisdom comes in. There's times when, when young people need to be pushed outside their comfort zone and do some work, even though they don't feel like doing it. But there are other days when the, the life of the school is such, maybe it is the day before Christmas break or, um, something weird or, or unusual has happened. Um, and, and you walk in with the understanding in your mind and heart, if I try to, to follow the plan today, it's going to fail. Mm -hmm. Then why would you continue down that road? <laughs> Isn't that when the lighter comes out and, and the flame is struck? And But, but I completely agree with you that the greater telos is the wisdom and virtue that you're trying to instill over these four years with this student. And, and so a quote unquote mm -hmm. unplanned detour still should be seeking that ultimate goal of wisdom and virtue, wisdom and virtue. The, the, the teacher that just, I don't feel like teaching today, let's play a game. They've lost sight of their telos. Right. Yeah. Like I, I honestly, I don't even know. Like, I don't even know how to, I, w I wouldn't even know how to talk to that person. Like I, 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 I'm literally speechless. If someone was to just say like, yeah, I just don't even care <laughs> or something, you know, like, how do you not? Well, I mean, th so the belly back to the Lewis picture, a teacher's got a belly too. They got appetites. They're going to, they're going to walk in tired. So I don't, I don't, right. I'm off my game today. And I get that. Sometimes that's when the plan saves you. Yeah. 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 Right. That's <laughs> well, Back last week or whenever, it seemed logical that we go over this stuff today. <laughs> it's somehow connected with what we did yesterday and what we're going to do tomorrow. So even if I don't feel like it, there's there's my map, and I'm gonna I, all I got to worry about at this point then is my own motivation, uh, which is kind of an argument between me and God, not between me and the students per se. Uh, but if I if I give away to that desire to just I'm not really going to do anything today, then I've brought the students into it, mm -hmm. and and they're unable – I mean, I have had students rescue a bad lesson by purposefully de derailing it. Um, that's one of the things about the humanities is it's really tough to bring into to the class discussion something that isn't relevant. <laughs> yeah. And my my students try, sure. right? They know my, my I have a deep and abiding love for the culinary arts. And if I teach a class, as I currently do, right before lunch – they will just about do anything they can to get me thinking about food. <laughs> well, one of the reasons I love talking about food is it is so seminal to human life yeah. that almost any text that we might be examining in English class <laughs> can come back to come back to food. Well, it's interesting that you'd bring up, you know, uh, lunch in a half an hour because that lunch scene. Right. Where the Bennets are all sitting around and trying to think through all their pride and prejudice, and, and you know, the, oh man, he took it back to the to whatever we were talking about in class. Um, right. But that's right. That's the art of teaching is having a plan that's mm -hmm. big enough and flexible enough to encompass whatever uh, Jack London moment. Yeah, you can color it in, shade it in, however you want on the fly. When that train comes around a bend and suddenly we see that, oh, there's this thing we hadn't anticipated, my telos is not destroyed by that unexpectedness. Uh, if it if it's useful to that telos, I, I just, with open arms, embrace it into the classroom instead of freaking out. That's, that's mm -hmm. to me, right. that highly telic personality is someone who can't flex, can't take the rabbit trail, can't can't go around the bend and the road, the railroad track's got to be <laughs> gut wrenchingly straight or it's just not going to work for them. And I, I, I can't teach that way. I, I don't know that, that at least my K-12, may, maybe it happens in college. I don't know. But, but K-12 experience that I have, you, you can't be totally telic with a kindergartner. No, it isn't. It, sorry, bro. It, <laughs> you're just not going to get there. There, that little hand's going to go up, and they're going to ask some question. Don't have any idea where it came from, but it needs answering. <laughs> sure. Well, so, they're going to think about it until you answer it, so you might as well just 
that's <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So no, I do. And and I think that's maybe kind of the well, not maybe. I I do. I think that is the role that liberty or sort of this tramp life of um of London um plays, you know, in in the life of the Christian educator. There is this sort of flexibility um or a a willingness to to play to mess around seemingly mess around um you know that that's really important for continuing the education process right the uh, yeah i just i like the way you said it all tell like all the time is not it's it's well now i'm waffling a bit all work and no play. Yeah, exactly. All that's I'm more comfortable with that because I do want to say we're always headed toward the same end, but all work and no play doesn't get us there. Right. right? Sprinting at the goal all the time is not the fastest way to get to the goal. Maybe well, and 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 if the end result of all work and no play is a dull boy. Mm-hmm. I think London would say he's not having any fun in life. Right. But but a, a Christian educator, classical educator like myself is going to say dull in the sense of not sharp, not broadly rounded, not classically trained. Because the best education prepares us for anything in life, not a specific thing in life. And... So I have no problem with a part of my teaching embodying and, and, and I think that that this is the setup, right, for us to have a conversation about the great little work, tiny little book. If you haven't read it, please get a hold of it. I'll put the information in the in the episode notes. But but Joseph Peeper. Yep, I knew you were sh- going there. He, he shocked his his audience. Peeper's a, a, a Catholic German philosopher writing during World War II. And right after World War II, he comes out with this this book entitled Leisure, Leisure, The Basis of Culture. And his opening apology for the work is why a work of philosophy right now in Germany when what we really ought to be doing is very practical, rebuilding our buildings, getting our stuff. And, and, and he defends very artfully the fact that the contemplative life, the philosophical life, asking why is way more valuable in that moment in Germany's history than just getting busy. Because if they just get busy rebuilding something that had so obviously gotten broken philosophically, they're going to rebuild the problem all over again. So um, I, I love that little book. I think it's an important read for someone who wants to to maintain their sanity in education. And his point is simple. I'm not going to develop it. It's just this, that we have lost the definition of scola, the the Latin term from which we derive school. Right. Which which scola in Latin means leisure. Yeah. Fine. And school school was supposed to be this place where children are taught to contemplate and figure out not just the meaning of life, but but anything important and worth thinking about, this is the place to do it. And and then they've replaced scola, leisure, with work. Mm-hmm. And as important as work is, especially in post-World War II Germany, right. he's saying that if it's all work, and and let's replace the word play here with contemplation – if you never work so that you might have time to think that work becomes very destructive in and of itself. And I think he clarifies for me why I think most young men in particular hate school today. Mm. And it's because it doesn't fulfill its purpose in their lives. It doesn't teach them to think for themselves it teaches them to perform for others, <laughs> to, to, to give back to adults what they right. need in order to get to the next level of their licensure to be adults. And you might even say that it uh, encourages them 
to believe that all telic endeavor is futile. Right. You know, that it's, it's like, this is horrible. <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's a, it's a grotesque. It's like if Picasso tried to paint it, it's all out of whack. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work mm -hmm. starts to look hideous when it's made the telos of man. Uh, we we're all created for work. It's all legitimate. It's a good thing. I tell my sons that every day because <laughs> they need to hear it every day. Right. But but why? And this is maybe I end here. The 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 one of the saddest things about being a father of young men now. My oldest is twenty five, uh, and he works in the workaday world in an office with mostly older men than him. And he watches them work hard day in day out. They'll take any overtime that's offered to them. They'll, they'll, uh, their their job is their life. Um, he even sometimes he's, he's going to be married here in the next year or so. He he laughs at the fact that some of them use the workplace as a way to escape married life. <laughs> and 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 I know people like that. And and it it is a sad, sure, inhumane way to live one's life um work provides us with the opportunity to live it isn't life itself and um mm -hmm. and, and i think mm -hmm. school should be teaching that not just as a as a proverb but as a as an embodied wisdom where Sure, the student on a given day sees the teacher today might be struggling a little bit to stick with the plan, but the end is never in question. Uh, wisdom and virtue is is what they're aiming at. Yeah, that's right. That's good. Well, guys, we're going to wrap it up, but um, we'll have Joseph Peeper coming soon because I want to keep talking about this, and I already have a poem for it. <laughs> I'll, I'll Spoiler, here it is now. I'll give it to you. It's... it's uh, there's a poem called Testament by Sister Therese that is about the best defense or um, understanding, apology, that's the word I'm looking for, the best apology for work that I've ever seen. It is amazing. Well, thanks again for joining us in this great conversation about education. We hope you will not just listen but participate. Leave us a comment, suggestion, or thought on our website. You just never know when we'll use it on the show. Until next time, pursue joy and learn something.